Good morning, everyone. It's Dr. Hodges. Um, it has been a little while since I've made some of my walking videos, um, but I have some time this morning. It's finally not raining. It's actually gorgeous outside. So I plan to try to whip out some videos for y'all um, for your viewing pleasure. So I was doing a little reading and, um, and I came upon an article on vitamins, nutrition, and I thought it was a very, um, um, not just timely, but I thought it was a good article for me to spur and discuss a little bit about the vitamins that you guys need to take after weight loss surgery, but more importantly, why you need to take specific vitamins. And um, typically for me, I will check, of course, preoperative labs, but then after your um, three month visit, I generally will order a set of labs and I'll go over the, those labs for you at your six month visit. One of the reasons why I like to wait till six months is you're going to be doing a lot of, you're gonna have a lot of changes. Um, over the first six months, actually you're gonna lose the majority of your weight, typically within the first six months. For most of my patients, they're gonna be down at least 50 to 60% of their expected weight loss. So you're gonna be down, like for instance, like if I predicted that you would lose 100 pounds, you're gonna be down at least 60 pounds at the six month mark, if not more. And so that has big impacts, not just on your weight, of course, but also on blood pressure, diabetes in particular. And so one of the lab values that we look at um, to see how well you're doing with your glucose is your hemoglobin A1C. Hemoglobin A1C, for all you folks out there that are diabetics, you know, you're well versed in this lab, but it basically gives us a snapshot of kind of what your, how well you've been controlling your glucose and your blood sugar levels over the last three months. That's one of the reasons why I don't like to get a hemoglobin A1C at the, between one and three months after surgery, because if you are diabetic, part of that time period is gonna be when you are still actively being treated for diabetes and you are on medication. Um, as many of you guys might know, for more than 80 to 90 percent of patients that have weight loss surgery, if they're diabetic, when they leave the hospital, they're able to come off their diabetes medicines. However, their um, hemoglobin A1C um, is going to improve over time. It will still be high when they leave the hospital, but it's going to drastically improve over time. And part of that is just the time period, because like I said, it's basically like a snapshot of 90 days. So I think by testing your hemoglobin A1C more at the six month mark, that's gonna give me a much, much more accurate picture of really where um, your glycosylated um, hemoglobin or where your blood sugar levels are, because it's going to give me um, a period of time when more than likely you're completely off all your diabetes medicine and you've been off your diabetes medicine for um, the entire time period that we're looking at. Um, moreover, you will have lost a lot of weight by then. Usually at the three month mark, you're down 40 to 60 pounds. So not only are you gonna be off your medicine, but that also gives you time for that hemoglobin A1C to even improve, not just um, not just show that you're no longer um, diabetic. So um, that's one of the one of the reasons why I like to draw my labs at that point. Another reason why I like to draw lab work around that part is, you know, again, patients are going to be going through a lot of changes during those first six months. If I have patients that are having difficulty getting in their protein, getting in their vitamins. When that happens, it's usually within the first couple of months. And that can happen for a variety of reasons. But for whatever reason it is, it doesn't change the fact that they still need to get in their protein, they still need to get in their iron, and they still need to get in the rest of their vitamins. 
and usually by the six month mark they've been able to overcome whatever hump it is that they encountered and they're now able to take those medicines on a more regular basis and so again i think testing labs at that point gives me a much more accurate picture because if i know somebody's struggling let's say and let's say they need to make sure that they're doing more protein well if i check their lab work <clears throat> and i see that their protein's low you know what i'm going to say looks like you need to do more protein <laughs> so i don't think that that gives us a really good accurate picture of where to move from so for instance let's say you were struggling the first three months and now the last three months you are compliant and you're doing what you need to do you don't have any symptoms from low protein and i check your lab work and your protein's low at that point that is when we may say hey maybe we need to increase your protein by another 10 to 12 or 10 to 20 grams that's when we can start to fine tune some of your supplementation. So with that being said, one of the common questions I get is, <clears throat> it's about calcium. I can't find calcium citrate. What about calcium carbonate? What's that PTH? So I kind of want to talk also a little bit about calcium, vitamin D, and PTH or parathyroid hormone. So as we all know, calcium, <clears throat> is required all of our bones are made up of calcium if you don't get enough calcium then you're at risk for osteoporosis and this is your little biology lesson for the day the reason why you're at risk for osteoporosis is calcium is also um, the um, element that is used in all the electrical workings in our body so your muscles need um, calcium to fire your nerves need muscle to fire. Just think of calcium almost as a way, it's like your body's electricity or one of the um, elements that's involved with the electrical operations of your body. <clears throat> and so there's a very fine um, um, range where that calcium needs to be. And the vast majority of your calcium, like 98%, is actually stored in your bones. The other two some odd percent is floating around in your blood. And your body is going to make sure that the calcium that's floating around in your blood, that's where it needs to be. Because if it is not where it needs to be, your muscles can't fire, your nerves can't fire, you have no electricity, and your body can't afford to have a blackout, so to speak. Um, ooh, you'll have to forgive me, this is a busy street. So, whenever your calcium is low, that is why you're at risk for osteoporosis because your body will begin to leach calcium from your bones in an effort to keep up with those calcium levels. So that's why it's important that you keep up with your, your calcium because your body's gonna get that calcium from somewhere. We would much rather they not get it from your bones because if you get, get it from your bones, your bones will become brittle and you're, um, you can have issues with fractures, things like that. <clears throat> And so, what does, how does vitamin D play into all this? So there's a couple of different pathways that your body uses to get calcium. Well, number one, it gets it from the, your bones if it has to. But number two, ooh, there's a little bit of glare on this. Sorry, you guys. But number two, you get calcium from the food that you eat. Vitamin D is a cofactor that your body uses and vitamin D is um, activated in your skin with sunlight, um, which is why a lot of us are lower in vitamin D because we just don't go out in the sun anymore or we wear sunblock. Or if you have darker skin, if you have more melanin in your skin, you're not gonna be as readily able to um, have um, the best vitamin D levels. And quite honestly, it's not uncommon for me to have patients that have low vitamin D whenever they come see me for their initial consult. But that's just because we just don't, we just don't go out in the sun anymore, honestly. So, but what vitamin D does when you take it is it tells your body to absorb calcium from the food that you eat. And so that's why so often whenever you go to the grocery store and you see calcium, it might have, um, it's calcium with vitamin D. 
Well, they just throw in a little bit of calcium, uh, pardon me, a little bit of extra vitamin D because they want you to try to more readily absorb their calcium. So that's why it's important that you take your vitamin D. Here's the caveat. Vitamin D is a fat soluble vitamin. That's another reason why if you are a weight loss surgery patient, especially a bypass or a switch, you might be more at risk for having a vitamin D deficiency because you're just not absorbing fat as readily. And so that's why you're gonna have a little bit more difficulty with a fat soluble vitamin. And so that's why we want you to be doing at least 5,000 IUs of vitamin D a day. If your vitamin D is low, you need to boop, boop, boop. You gotta pop that sucker up, take 10,000 IUs, take that every day. Sometimes I'll leave it half for my patients. I'll give them the prescription of vitamin D. It's actually the form that, in prescription form is vitamin D2. Um, but then I'll also have them take vitamin D3 which is kind of the best form. Um, and I'll have that, the, I'll have patients to take that on a daily basis. So, you need your calcium so you can have your electricity. You need your vitamin D so you can absorb your calcium. What does PTH and how does that factor in into everything whenever you're looking at your labs? PTH is parathyroid hormone. And your parathyroids are four little glands that live alongside your thyroid, hence the name parathyroid. They're like right here and right there, okay? They're about the size of a pea. And parathyroid hormone also helps to um, control the levels of your calcium. So if calcium is low, parathyroid hormone will go up. In bariatric patients, if you, if your calcium is on the low to normal side, but your vitamin D is low, your PTH will really be up. And so whenever we're getting lab work on patients, we always like to get PTH on patients, um, their calcium levels, vitamin D, and I also like to get an ionized calcium because that form of the calcium is not related um, to like protein bound calcium so if you're low in your protein um you if you're low in your protein it's going to give me a much more accurate picture of where your calcium is um as to whether or not you truly have a calcium deficiency um and so pth if that is high that means you're low in vitamin d if you're low in vitamin d that means that that's going to have a negative effect on your body's ability to absorb calcium. So even if your calcium levels look normal, that is why you could be prone to osteoporosis because if your vitamin D is low, remember your body's gonna be getting that calcium from somewhere. So that's why, important, that's why it's important that you're taking both calcium and vitamin D. Now, for the last question that patients have, Dr. Hodges, I can't find any calcium citrate. All I see is calcium carbonate. And what I like to tell patients is this, you know, Tums, that is calcium carbonate. If my daughter, who's five, sat down and had a whole bottle of Tums, I would have to call poison control because she would have taken in so much calcium. But ideally, what, why we want patients to take calcium citrate, or we prefer that is, pardon me, if you ingest calcium, and there's not a lot of acid in your stomach, then calcium citrate, it's much, much more easily absorbed. So if you are a sleeve, if you are a bypass, if you are a switch, and all those instances, you're gonna have less stomach tissue available to make a bunch of acid. Furthermore, most of my bariatric patients, especially for the first 90 days, I have you on acid suppression while those staple lines are all healing. So again, when you were to take in your calcium, it's gonna be in an environment where there's less acid. That's why we like calcium citrate. So how do we remedy that? If you cannot find a good calcium citrate, and I'll be honest, I mean, you go to the grocery store sometimes and you find a calcium and it's a great big horse pill. I mean, 
for the love, please do not take that right after surgery. It will get stuck and your sweet little bariatric surgeon will have to go in with the endoscope and scoop that bad boy out. So what do you do if you can't find calcium citrate? Well, you can do calcium carbonate, that would be like Tom's um, or some other variety of calcium that you find at the grocery store. But what's important is in that instance, you need to make sure that you're taking it with food because generally whenever you start to eat, your body's going to start making more acid. And so that will help to pump up the acid production or overall acid levels in your stomach and make that calcium more readily um, absorbed. So does that kind of all make sense? So in the end, what does this all mean? Take your calcium, take your vitamin D. If you see a high PTH, that means your vitamin D is low. So you need to pump up that vitamin D. Ideally take calcium citrate. Um, if you can't get in calcium citrate, then take calcium carbonate, but make sure you're eating whenever you're taking the calcium carbonate so you can increase that acid. And then finally, make sure that if you're doing calcium, regardless of the form, you need, you need to be doing 1,000 to 1,500 milligrams a day. Um, and if you're doing vitamin D, you need to be doing at least 5,000 IUs a day. So hope that this little science lesson helped. I was a little bit long-winded today. Sorry about that. Um, and I'll see you guys next time.